IDSS Distinguished Speaker Series today. Thanks for, for coming. Uh, we have the pleasure of hosting uh, Dr. Robert Hampshire, um, who is actually was also here visiting us uh, almost 10 years ago. This is what we're oh discussing God. when it was still uh, engineering the engineering systems division here. So it's kind of a homecoming in a way, and we're delighted to have you back. He now really serves at the front line of research uh, in government. So he's Deputy Assistant Secretary for Research and Technology and Chief Science Officer at the US Department of Transportation. Um, he received his PhD in Operations Research and Financial Engineering from Princeton University and uh, was a professor at the Ford School of Public Policy at the University of Michigan. Um, and he has a very interesting systems engineering approach to dealing with uh, important questions of transportation in a, in an array of different contexts. Um, and he and also looking very actively on the environmental impacts as well as equity and access. So I'm, I'm delighted to welcome you, and we very much look forward to the talk. Thanks, Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Well, thank you. Okay, good, the mic works. Uh, thank you for having me back. It's really terrific to see really great friends here that I made during my time when I visited as a uh, Martin Luther King uh, visiting professor uh, back about 10 years ago. So uh, thank you uh, for having me back. Good to see all the great shining faces today. Uh, so like you mentioned, I'm the uh, chief science officer for the Department of Transportation, but also my office leads all, all the research across all the modes of transportation, from aviation to rail to transit to pipelines, which is part of DOT. And uh, what I want to do today is really talk about, you know, how we're thinking about transforming the future of transportation. You know, particularly the role we play to collectively together in defining that future, and particularly ways in which research technology can help pave the path for that future. Uh, so what I want to do is just lay out some of the national challenges, even international global challenges that we face as a world and a country and how they impact transportation. But particularly then, you know, describe a couple of the activities we have going on in the department uh, to help address those challenges and hopefully get some of you excited enough to come, you know, uh, work on those challenges. I know you, some of you already are, of course. Uh, but also get, inspire you and maybe enlist you uh, in helping to address uh, uh, some of these key challenges. So in some ways, that'll be the structure of the talk. I, I, we're not, I'm not going to be going through any particular uh, research studies and findings and so forth, but really just giving you a sense of some of the great challenges facing uh, this nation, honestly, and the opportunities in front of us. So the division, division we put forward at the at the Department of Transportation is really one of a system of systems that are centered around people. And here, you know, of course, as, a, as, a, uh, as humans, we used to think that the planets revolved around uh, the Earth, you know, and but we certainly found out, okay, we re revolve around the sun. But in the same way, in transportation, we often think about people revolving around modes of transportation. But what we're doing here in this, in our research vision and what we're in the department is that transportation should revolve around people. So people in the center. So it's not like you walk or bike or you're driving your car. No, can you thrive in your life? What's your well-being like? And how can transportation, regardless of the mode, help facilitate that well-being? It's really the perspective, really, we're centered around people. You know, from the you know, Transcontinental Railroad all the way to the Wright Brothers to Apollo 11, we know that transportation has really been at the forefront of opening up new frontiers in our society and ushered in you know, particularly new eras of innovation. You know, new forms of mobility can change our perspectives about time, distance, and the world in general. And transportation really is an innovation that sparks human advancement. And so we're really thinking about the ways we move as, as a precursor to advancement in many other domains. So as we know, we're now prepared to take on this next challenge of our nation's transportation uh, history. We've developed 
this research pl uh, vision that we released a, a couple months ago. So you can find it online, the research plan that I'll kind of kind of uh, walk through. But it really is about pushing the frontiers of innovation. You know, establishes our national goals as a, a national system over the next five years, but also guides our implementation of the historic bipartisan infrastructure law, which is $1.2 trillion. So as we're building out roads and bridges today, we need to be guided by strong science evidence to improve people's lives today, but set that roadmap for the future. So that's what this research uh, vision uh, uh, does. And additionally, we know that transformative innovations must also be broadly accessible, especially to historically underserved and disadvantaged communities. So many parts, for example, many parts of the modern civil rights movement, you know, from the bus boycotts in the 1950s to the marches uh, from Selma to Alabama, which the, hit, which the anniversary was just last week on, have focused really on the free, safe, and equitable movement of people as a fundamental human right and a civil right. And so it's also in that context we've seen over the last three or four years, for example, with some of the, the movements for racial justice recently, I also focused on enforcement in vehicles, uh, people stopping in highway, on highways to stop traffic. And that, that's because people know that transportation is a powerful force in this society. And so as we think about research and what we're, we're broadly what we're doing in the transportation sector, we need to keep in mind that the movement of people your movement as an individual is so deeply tied to movements toward justice and the transportation system itself as a catalyst for mobility and social, as social and economic mobility as well. So movement of people <laughs> impacts economic mobility. And so what I want to do is kind of walk through some of the, the great challenges that we've laid out under, with this vision in mind uh, particularly to help us gain and continue to gain our global leadership, at, particularly in, in America, as we at work for the U.S. Department of Transportation, we really want to make sure that our role is one in which we're making sure that we're people-centered and we have thriving uh, communities. So, like I said, to reinforce this vision, we produced this five-year strategic plan, which I'm not, not going to delve in too, too deeply, but except to say that as we're implementing this bipartisan infrastructure law, it really is this research evidence data that's going to help us make sure that we're building towards the future and not building in yesterday's innovations for today. Right? We want to be forward-looking. And to do that, we presented a, a set of grand challenges. And what I want to do is kind of walk through uh, some of those as well. But before we get there, it's really also, a lot of this is in the context of what we're doing, uh, not just the research vision, but for the whole department, as we look at some of the key goals, which is certainly safety. We know that you know, a safer transportation system of the future, particularly in light of the 43,000 people who died last year, in our transportation system. We know that the transportation system must, has to live up to our climate responsibilities. The transportation system in the US is the largest contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. We want to make sure we have a more equitable system, particularly knowing that people's access to jobs, health care, and opportunity, like I was saying, is guided by their mobility. And we saw during COVID, for sure, that the transportation logistics and supply chain system needs to be much more resilient to shocks and stresses uh, from either global pandemic to international conflict to extreme heat, sea level rise. We see that resilience is going to be increasingly, increasingly more important as we move forward. But let me just dive in quickly what, what some activities we're doing in safety and some of the, the key challenges. So we put forth 
this challenge of, around safety together, we want to make sure that we're striving, and this is something that Secretary uh, Buttigieg and the department has committed to, is to strive to move towards zero fatalities in the transportation system. Zero is the, really the only acceptable number of deaths that we should be striving towards. Achieving this vision of zero fatalities would take effort across society to change you know, how we design and operate our system. Like I said, there's more than 43,000 fatalities. That was in 2021 on the roads. Those numbers increased in 2022 in the US. You know, sometimes we can kind of get lost in the numbers about these fatalities. Um, you know, for each one of these fatalities, you know, that's one less mom, dad, brother or sister for someone. You know, that's one less person. And, you know, if you look, if you look to your left or to your right, you know, that one less person, you know, that person could be sitting right next to you. Many of us has been impacted, I know I have personally, by the, you know, the pangs of grief of, of losing someone I've known to an avoidable car crash, for example, that a lane cap keeping assist could have easily prevented. So there's, you know, these things are, are, are very personal and impact all of us, particularly on the safety side. And so part of our research portfolio and the key, one of the top priorities for the department, of course, is safety. And we put forward a, a renewed uh, research uh, agenda in safety to provide new insights into transportation safety, uh, particularly around challenges that we can leverage some of the great data, technology, and research across many disciplines, you know, particularly as we look in to improve these safety outcomes from advances in you know, human factors to, you know, we know biomechanics sorts of things, but also uh, uh, things about roadway design, uh, things about, <laughs> we have to re look, we have to renew our, our focus on distraction. You know, how do we make sure folks aren't distracted when they're driving? And so all these are really uh, uh, in part of the renewed efforts in the department to look at, uh, at safety research. And one of the key frameworks is a safe systems approach. You know, we're all kind of systems people in here today. You know, really to take a, a multi-layered, multi-discipline, holistic approach uh, to safety, not just vehicle design, but a lot of the other disciplines uh, that we mentioned. And another key aspect of, of safety that I, that I will touch on as well has to do with cybersecurity. You know, we're entering a new age of, you know, cyber threats across different threat vectors and modalities. I'll say a little bit more about that later. Um, but certainly that's a key aspect of uh, cybersecurity. Also, as we think about safety, you know, I, I do have to you know, acknowledge safety across all modes. We talk about roadway fatalities, but we know most recently with East Palestine, you know, rail safety is a priority for the department. Uh, has been for many years, but certainly redoubling down on efforts there. Aviation, we know from a global competitive standpoint, our FAA runs the safest, you know, gold star uh, uh, aviation system in the world. And actually many of you I know here probably have worked with the FAA. MIT has a really long history of working with the FAA on, on safety. Uh, but certainly it's a multimodal endeavor when we think about safety. One activity I want to tell you about specifically is an opportunity coming up that I would love to work with some of you all on, and that has to do with intersection safety. Uh, we're launching uh, something called an intersection safety challenge that really looks to engage innovators across the country to develop technology and human factors driven safety systems that can enhance, greatly enhance the safety at high risk intersections by mitigating crashes and reducing the number of roadway fatalities. So I mentioned the, you know, uh, the 43,000 people who died in crashes uh, in 2021. It turns out about a quarter of those roadway fatalities happen at intersections. You know, that's more than, again, 10,000 people 
per year, roughly, that are dying at intersections. That includes more than 2,000 pedestrians and bicyclists in 2021 that died at intersections. That's, like I said, that's completely um, unacceptable. I know that you know, at intersections, uh, particularly in busy intersections, it's very dangerous. Um, so I'm from a small town in Ohio, a tiny town. But I remember growing up vividly the first time I went to New York City in Times Square with my family. I was there with my dad. Then you got to know my dad uh, grew up in the 40s in like rural South, Al you know, rural Alabama. You know, and so he always has like these nuggets of like wisdom to share from like old time wisdom. And I, I remember we're in, New York, in Times Square, uh, you know, so incredibly busy, kind of like complex intersection. And uh, so I'm, I'm walking there, I'm maybe like 13 years old. I know everything, of course, right? So I'm like, the walk sign at an intersection turns green. And I immediately start to walk. And my dad says, wait a minute. He, he quickly pulls me back <laughs> by my collar from the intersection. And they right as like a delivery vehicle just like went right past. You know, that still sticks with me because it was really scary. And I, I, you know, after I caught my breath, I was like, oh, but dad, the sign said walk. And he said, OK, you might be right, but you could have been dead right as well, you know? And that lesson kind of sticks with me today that this intersection safety challenge, which I'll tell you more about here, really is about providing a redundant set of sensing and, and control interventions at intersections that make sure that people don't die. People, we make mistakes. We might cross when we shouldn't. Someone might run a yellow light when they shouldn't, but what, what I'm saying is that that shouldn't be the cause of someone dying. So can we make it so people can make mistakes and everyone still live, OK? And that's, to what degree can we do that? And so this intersection safety challenge really sits on the, the premise that you know, we can really take technologies uh, that were initially created for applications like autonomous vehicles, so LIDAR, sensing, path planning, other navigation, connectivity, sensor fusion that's typically on an automated vehicle. And can we move those from the mo mobile domain to a stationary domain at the intersection to help create real-time warning systems to help vulnerable road users. So the idea is there's a lot of great innovation that's happened. You know, there's a good cost curves that are going down on LIDAR and all the other pieces in the AV stack. Can we put that, those intersections, particularly cheap enough, say under $10,000, so that cities and places can adopt it and deploy it at intersections. So that's something we're calling, let me move here, the intersection safety challenge. And so, uh, earlier in the fall, we put out something called a request for information. This is something that you learn in government. There's like all these mechanisms. One's called a request for information that shows up in something called the Federal Registry, where all government like communications needs to be published in this. And we asked the community, and many, some of you all might have replied, what sort of technology sensing, connectivity approaches could we use to dramatically improve safety at intersections? And we got an overwhelming response to that RFI. Uh, we're in the process now of developing what ultimately will become a challenge. I'm not announcing it yet here, but a, 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 cha a prize challenge to really see who can pull together more like a systems integration thing, can pull together a, a, a system that performs well under a set of use cases. So that should be uh, coming online very shortly. We're, we have a webinar um, by the, sometime by the end of the month um, that you can look out for, a webinar that describes the details of the challenge and particularly, specifically what we're looking for. 
it's a, um, roughly about the $20 million uh, scale with prizes. We have to see what the final numbers on the $5 million or so range. Multiple prizes of that scale for people who can demonstrate an intersection, integrated safety system at intersections. That's an opportunity that's, that's coming online soon in the safety domain. One aspect, and I want to change gears a little bit, one aspect of the domain of research at DOT, Department of Transportation, it turns out is the Department of Transportation is the civilian lead for GPS. So we know that the G GPS system is a military system, but for all non-military uses of GPS, that's the responsibility of the Department of Transportation. And it turns out that part of my office runs the position, navigation, and timing responsibilities. And there's incredible opportunity. It's a, it's a layer of, of technology, of infrastructure, that many of us take for granted. This is GPS. It's in your phone. Uh, but it turns out that this is incredibly important for you know, all things we do in transportation, but also the safety and security of GPS. So one of the, like I mentioned, we're the civilian lead for all things position, navigation, and timing. For the transportation, there's a, in aviation, it's sort of clear. You need to, pilots need to know where they are, <laughs> you know, where they're going, uh, and also what time it is. That under, underestimated aspect of GPS network is really the satellites is actually the timing. The time part is incredibly important for synchronization, um, particularly in transportation and other domains. And so we use it from aviation uh, to rail. There's a system called positive train control. It's almost like automated braking, but for your trains, that really depends on the GPS and timing network. Uh, in maritime and shipping, of course, that's the original sort of navigation. People who are sailors here know how to do probably dead reckoning or something. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> um, but of all others, we use GPS. And of course, in some of the, like the intersection safety challenge I just told you about, when it comes time to locate, localizing, you need to have also typically a good clock. You had to have good clock synchronization. So it's important to transportation, we know. But again, like I mentioned, there's a ton of other important use cases across all of our um, economy, particularly around uh, GPS. So for example, agriculture, precision agriculture, is incredibly important. Uh, companies like Caterpillar, John Deere, for example, depend heavily on GPS. So much so that John Deere has actually launched their own LEO, Low Earth Orbit Constellation, to do position, navigation, and timing. Uh, in the financial sector, Wall Street, we know timing of transactions are sort of indexed on GPS. So the bottom line, this is a layer of infrastructure that when I joined the Department of Transportation, I did. it was in my peripheral view, but not really in, the, in my front uh, mirror, but it's incredibly important for our infrastructure. And there's tremendous um, opportunities for innovation and systems integration and modeling and all those great fun things in the GPS um, world. But the reason I put this under safety is because it turns out that un there's a lot of challenges to position, navigation, and timing. Some of them are natural barriers we know about, like underground garages and urban canyons and multi-path and all the kind of things that happen. Um, but also, there's more nefarious sort of actors uh, who, spoof, who can spoof, jam, do things with GPS signals that are of critical importance. Um, Actually, let me go back one. One of the key users of, of GPS that, that I didn't quite fully appreciate here is on power, power grids. So you know, 
electric power generation. You know, you have your <laughs> synchronization of the, you know, 60 hertz cycle, you know, for the AC power. That timing for what that cycle is based off of GPS. That's the timing component to generate reliable clock cycles for, for power. So th these are really important for critical infrastructure. Uh, it actually turns out that, again, there's really research and, and, and a lot of work to be done about making this more resilient. And this is not just hypothetical. So on December 17th of, of this past year, the FAA issued a warning that the Dallas airport was experiencing GPS anomalies that, dramatically, that was dramatically impacting all arrivals and all departures in the whole airport. This condition lasted for three days. I don't know if anyone was around, flew in and out of Dallas then. Uh, hundreds of flights were diverted and were forced to fly in, in manual mode. Uh, there were pilots while flying, didn't know their coordinates or where they were in the air, not just um, also altitude, so not, not just latitude, longitude, but also altitude. So GPS has a Z coordinate, by the way, that a lot of us don't always use, but it's there. It's very accurate. So this, can, this was a, a warning that FAA issued. It, they also said, I'm reading from the announcement, this is an unplanned uh, disruption, and the cause is unknown. This disruption actually extends up to Oklahoma and to New Mexico. Uh, it was pre unpredictable to remain in effect for, like I said, three days. That was just one of the examples that we can talk about here. So it turns out that GPS is incredibly important to our infrastructure. It's something that, as a research at DOT and tech, we have quite a bit of activity on developing, we call it complementary uh, PNT, uh, position navigation timing and backups to GPS. Uh, there's pieces of legislation that require us to do that. Um, and in fact, for example, so we're fostering an active ecosystem of industry and academic innovators who are developing and deploying what we call complementary PNT systems. From launching uh, LEO, other LEO satellites to uh, uh, using fiber optics for timing uh, to other approaches. Um, there's really great new developments on magnetic maps of the Earth. They're actually quite good for navigation as well as enhanced celestial navigation. So, you know, old school looking at by the stars and navigating, but the new version of that. In addition, working with the Department of Energy on new uh, quantum clocks. So way to, new ways to do timing that are independent of GPS. So it turns out there's um, atomic clocks in all the GPS satellites. Um, and to do the calculations properly for GPS, you actually need, like, uh, I think, general, general relativity to do the calculations. And so this is a really fun domain of, of, of work that I had no idea about. I just wanted the folks in this room to think more about space, particularly around uh, PNT and navigation, and well, because we see the proliferation of new LEO constellations and satellite launches that are putting new assets up in space. So it turns out one approach is something uh, other GN, uh, global navigation systems in space that we can do like signals of opportunity where you can actually use existing satellites that are in, in orbit, collect the signal from those and do some algorithms that provide accurate GPS position navigation, position and timing. So you can use existing satellites, for example, like Starlink, for example, satellites, and use those to create your own reliable GPS system. So we're funding work in this area. Uh, that's one of, I wanted to tell you guys about it because there's uh, really great opportunities there as well.
and I'll kind of move a little bit faster here. Another one of the, so that was safety. Another big piece of the grand challenge is around economic strength and global competitiveness, particularly around supply chains. So I'll just tell you about one effort in this, in this work, in this stream, coming out of the disruptions of COVID, where we work very closely with port operators, ocean carriers, uh, the freight system in this country to try to coordinate and ameliorate the backlog that we saw during COVID. In this, so this administration stood up a, supply, a White House supply chain task force. I think some of you may have even been consulted in that effort here from MIT uh, to really get the system back up and running. And more than that, to make our goods movement chain a national asset, not a national liability that we saw that the, the, some of the weaknesses. So one program that came out of that is called Flow. Might be of particular interest to you all. It's a data sharing uh, platform where it's a joint effort uh, where entities, we have over 70 entities from the largest retailers to basically all the ocean carriers, port operators that are sharing uh, information, particularly forward orders for uh, good containers. Uh, we've been facilitating this. Um, our Bureau of Transportation Statistics that falls under the office that I run is the sort of third party steward. We have you know, some FOIA and subpoena protections around those data. So we, the companies are very are confident sharing those data with us. We're providing then uh, forward forecasts at a regional uh, level, particularly ports and regional level about what demand is looking like. And that way, this just provides some first order kind of visibility into the supply network. So this has been a, a very successful program thus far. Certainly we're working to make versions of these data available publicly and to researchers. But this is something that doesn't exist anywhere else, particularly in the private sector. We've call, uh, created this network uh, given some of the federal protections around uh, data sharing privacy. So anyway, you can ask questions about that if, later if you want to get involved in that. The other piece on grand challenges I want to, is certainly around equity. And I mentioned a, a bit about that in, in my opening. But what I want to do is, is really you know, give you a sense of some of the, one of the activities that we're up to um, last year, we released our equity action plan. And particularly one aspect of that, is, so we have four, four pillars, like the wealth creation, is really about, like I said, we're putting, the infrastructure bill is putting about $1.2 trillion into the economy. We know that infrastructure investments in the past have actually disempowered communities by building roads through them, particularly underserved communities. We've no, you know, so part of what we want to do under wealth creation is to make sure that those communities that are impacted by our infrastructure investment actually have a net increase in their economic well-being. And that includes those who are doing the projects. And so we have a, a big effort, and that's also in research. Who's doing the research? What organizations and entities? So we have a big effort in, around wealth creation. Power of community, again, here is about making sure that, and this is for, I don't know, from DUSP or our planners, making sure that we have engagement strategies and people at the table helping to define uh, those projects. So really great opportunities for research and engagement around public, around public uh, engagement. And so that's that piece. Interventions here is a, really about providing assistance, technical assistance to communities to help scope out projects, to help uh, deliver on those projects once they're awarded. If we're doing like an ITS, like connected vehicle project in a given area, for example, like we have to make sure that the, the community that lives there knows what those systems are, how to develop them, how to make them work. And lastly, I just want to talk to, a little bit about expanding access. Here, we're developing a national transportation cost burden, cost burden measure. 
So this is really the uh, analytic, a new measurement that we're developing based off original survey uh, collection and design together with available uh, census data and other Department of Labor uh, and so forth data to really understand particularly around the outcomes of our outcomes and impact on people and how the transportation system is related to that. So we're thinking about outcome measures like health, outcome measures like education. We know that typically like employment, but really we're trying to find, create a measure or index that captures the transportation impact on, on those things that people care about in their everyday lives. As it relates to the climate and sustainability, certainly, like I mentioned, that the transportation sector is responsible for, as you guys know, more greenhouse gas emissions than any other sector in the US. So we feel our role as a department, as an administration, the transportation should lead the decarbonization of our, our economy. And so we have several activities underway. I'll just talk about one that you guys may know about. Was this the joint office? that was created between the Department of Energy and the Department of Transportation. And the goal of this office, as it was created, was to develop a network of 500,000 charging stations throughout the country. And that's the primary mission of that office right now. And this is on the electrification side. Certainly, the Department of Energy has the know-how when it comes to the power generation, battery technologies, vehicle uh, technologies, us from the Department of Transportation standpoint, we really have the, the lead on the infrastructure, the siting uh, of these um, chargers and facilities, as well as the impact they might have on communities. And so a really great set of research opportunities and funding in this area around, you know, how do we think about that process, particularly like where things should be sited, how, what versions of technology, you know, what standards. You know, uh, two weeks ago, the, the, this joint office put out uh, charger minimum standards. You might have seen some companies opening up their networks to allow other people to charge. You know, so really trying to create a nationwide network where uh, the cr creates the, where people feel safe buying an electric vehicle, knowing they, they can charge, particularly during long haul, long trips. And so this is a, a key priority uh, of the department. That's a, something we're operationalizing right now, but there's really great research opportunities as this scaffolded around and support this effort. And lastly, I want to talk a little bit about some transformation, this transformation goal. You know, the transportation system of the future, we really see it as it will integrate both digital and physical infrastructure together in a seamless, in a seamless way to support the safe and reliable movements of good and goods and people. This integrated system of systems will certainly need to, you know, generate secure, reliable data. You know, where drivers and others can make users of the transportation system can make decisions uh, more informed and support the development of the innovative business models and systems to improve the life of our traveling public. And so it really is this integrated sort of system to systems approach that we're, lens that we're bringing to the problem. I want to talk to you about like three programs. This is a select set of new activities that are really wanting to, putting the department on a forward footing as it relates to transformation and innovation. One is a program called SMART. This is a program that really is about demonstrating uh, a technology in communities that helps solve some of the key challenges in that, those communities. And so this is a five-year program, $100 million a year, uh, here to help demonstrate various uh, technologies throughout the country. We're, we should be making announcements here soon, in the next couple of weeks, about the winners in the first round here. Um, but to give you a sense of uh, some of the some of the underlying technologies, of course, here smart grid is a, a big category. Like I just talked about with electrification, 
Uh, we have a lot of activity around first and last mile delivery, uh, a lot on connected vehicles. I know I was talking to Kathy and others. We, as a department, we're supporting the deployment of connectivity, particularly on, on the infrastructure side. And we're going to put you know, our money where our mouth is. We want, we're trying to lead the development, continue on connected vehicles and connected infrastructure. Uh, also, on the aviation side, really the, the advanced air mobility and, and electric vertical takeoff and lift systems are in the scope of this program. And you'll, you'll see her, her shortly that we're making big investments, not in technology for technology's sake, but the people who submitted proposals under the SMART program I identified true needs for their community that can be solved by these technologies. That's sort of the approach we're taking. And I encourage you, uh, universities have applied, so let me go back. The eligible entities here are state and local governments, tribal transit agencies, but we also saw many universities partnering with their state and locals to apply for these grants. So I encourage you to, to do that uh, next cycle as well. Another program that many of you are very familiar with is our University Transportation Centers program, UTC program. Um, here, the program, as you know, is really a, it's a consortium of universities around the country that we fund to do research. These are grants. So they're sort of the, the institutions can do exploratory. They, they, you know, they propose a set of activities, but then we kind of leave them alone to go do the work. You know, and so last week, oh, let me go back. Two weeks ago, actually, we announced 34 uh, new consortiums of universities that um, received almost $90 million of funding for the, this round of university transportation centers. Um, MIT received funding as, as part of two <laughs> of the consortiums. So two out of the 20, 34 consortiums had uh, MIT faculty members associated with them. Uh, it's super competitive. We had you know, over you know, uh, 270 applications for roughly 34 centers. Um, and so really, my charge for the department as we put this program together is that I want to make sure that we're working on transformative work, advanced research. Uh, the, uh, I discourage heavily incremental kind of research that oftentimes happens. I, what I want us to do is be much more innovative in this program. And so the proposals that we saw have moved in that direction. We want folks to take high risk shots at things that could, you know, could fail. They should fail. All your projects as part of the UTC program, you know, shouldn't be successful. If everything you worked on, this I'm kind of safe to, to my team, like, if everything that folks are proposing works, we weren't being risky enough. You know? And so that's sort of the tone and, and scope of the program for our university transportation centers. And it spanned from safety research to cybersecurity to climate uh, to infrastructure. And I want to sort of end on, on this one. One of the new transformative but I think opportunities in the bipartisan infrastructure law was a creation of the Advanced Research Project Agency for Infrastructure, we call it ARPA-I. ARPA-I is modeled after DARPA and ARPA-E. It will bring, toge you know, bring together leaders from technical fields to run programs, so we have program manager kind of model, to fund teams from industry, academia, and entrepreneurs as they tackle the most ambitious priorities we face in our transportation system. You know, it will work hand in glove with partners who operate and own the infrastructure to deploy those new solutions. So the idea here is that we want to get things to scale, and we're going to have the research and the people who own those systems working together to get to scale quickly. Uh, you know, this is a flexible, sort of more fast-moving model uh, uh, for research, the ARPA model, you know, particularly to dramatically accelerate 
some of the key solutions and approaches that we need in our complex transportation system. So, you know, we've been seeing the most recent wave of, of innovations across, you know, different sectors from AI, machine learning, you know, um, ILT, advanced manufacturing, and so forth, that have been penetrating and, and getting into other sectors of society much, much faster than in transportation. We should have 3D printed roads and sidewalks by now and bridges by now. We probably should have automated construction to the most dangerous aspects of building things. This should be automated, for example. You know, and so the transportation se sector as a whole, if you look at the productivity indexes, is a laggard globally in productivity. And it's because infusion of new technology has not made its way into the sector fast enough. And so part of ARPA-I is really addressing that challenge about, of how low productivity the transportation sector is and how do we move, help accelerate that. So we're very excited about ARPA-I um, and helping with those challenges. ARPA-I, like I said, was, the, was created in the infrastructure bill and was initially all appropriated with money uh, a couple months ago. Uh, a small amount of money to get started, staffing, planning, but we certainly uh, want to listen to the community here that's on the cutting edge of the creating and deploying uh, a technology that can make a safer but also more productive. And so here's an example of, this is by no means you know, completely, a complete list, but the types of things that ARPA-I would take on from, you know, from a materials and structure and construction standpoint. You know, we know there's a lot of work being done on negative or even zero, even negative carbon materials. But those things like, how do those things get to scale? How do you get dump trucks and, and tractors and who actually deploy particular uh, new materials, for example, from 3D printing to accelerated uh, methods of, for roads, pipelines, harbors, this includes the shoreline and ports. So we've been in, in conversation certainly with our friends at Army Corps of Engineers and others to think about resilience of our, our, our coasts. On the digital side, that is, we don't need a lot of uh, explanation there. And it crosses all modes. So again, transportation from rail to maritime to crosses across all, all modes of, of transportation and infrastructure. And particularly, there's, like I said, important cross-cutting technologies in, that enable infrastructure from, like I said, GPS and PNT through cybersecurity and cyber-aware designs. And so this is sort of, like I said, by no means exhaustive, but the types of things, there are opportunities that are out there to really increase the, the productivity and safety dramatically of our infrastructure systems. So with that being said, you know, I could show, I could have shown like a lot more examples, but you know, I just want to give you all a, a flavor of the, of the type of work that, that we've been doing at the Department of Transportation, particularly, you know, in the time of these great challenges and uncertainty that we just come out of COVID, where we're all trying to return to work, but there's real security and safety threats that we're facing as a nation. So we're looking particularly outward to communities like, like you all, stakeholders, innovators from across the country. So I'm doing a, a range of these, these talks and engagements to really listen and, and, and work together with, with all of you to make sure that we have a, a transportation system that really is one that improves the life and thriving of communities, one that's centered around people in their communities so we can have one that's safe, you know, it's an un, unacceptable number of people who are dying. Accessible, we know there's many people who are cut off from the benefits of transportation. And ultimately one that is sustainable and leads the way through us getting through the climate crisis that we're in. And so I'll just stop there and just say thank you. Hopefully, I would love to take any questions or 
or comments on any of the activities I talked about in, in ways that we can uh, work together. So with that, thank you for having me. I see a hand up for a question. So I feel like we're, it's kind of like safe to assume that freight and logistics relies a lot on cooperation with other countries. And since now the U.S. is like working on a strategy uh, to better and make its transportation a little bit more efficient, um, would, are these plans kind of like shared or with other countries to make the process a little bit more integrated and, and efficient? Or is it just something that's purely based on like locally making uh, strategies more uh, easier to kind of like go forward with? No, that's a great question. And there's certainly there's activities um, globally with our international partners to help coordinate, get visibility into the supply chains, the safety of those supply chains. And so that work continues uh, at the Department of Transportation, but also State Department and colleagues uh, at the White House are, are certainly working with, with other countries on, on synchronization. Great question. Any other questions, comments? So thanks a lot. This is actually great. Um, I have some detailed questions maybe I'll ask a little later, but sort of a <clears throat> broader question about the objectives of, of what you're trying to accomplish, because it's very broad and very complex. And um, it's sort of, you know, I didn't see in the presentation, I saw a lot of stuff, but I didn't see sort of kind of a, an Ebenezer design of the transportation system, you know? Oh, what kind of design? Like an Ebenezer, like from, from, from scratch, scratch, right? You know, in the sense that, you know, a place where public transportation is in place that we're, you know, we're thinking about, uh, when you think about communities, yes, displaced communities, but also commute time and so forth, right? That was factored in here. But it's, it seems like a lot of it is patch up jobs. We have what we have and we're gonna patch it and now we're gonna patch it at this large scale. How can you patch something at this large scale? You just keep increasing complexities and not necessarily solving all the problems. So this is a great, great point about Oh, uh, so part of what I said about the research plan is it really sets the stage for we have this $1.2 trillion, some large fraction that is going to transportation right now. So we're building right now. We need to make sure that we have the data evidence approaches to make those funds as effective as possible. But we're also putting forward a longer term, like you mentioned, you know, 20, 30, even 50 year roadmap of some a vision of a system that is much dramatically better. And so that's sort of the, the balance we need to do. We want to create results now, but also set us up in a way that we call it future-proofing the system for the future. So that is a great point, the delicate balance. We're not doing like a tabula rasa sort of thing where we just can create you know, uh, something out of nothing. We have a system now. Uh, and so I think there's a balance there. That's a great, great point. about how you think about and how the department um, thinks about um, stimulating private investment and innovation toward these goals versus public investment, and sort of where the public transportation stops and private transportation you know, comes in and how these interface, because it seems like that is important. I'm sure you know, about it the lot as well. The plan is, especially with all this money going into transportation from the government, yeah. can you make it so much, yeah. you know, greater by yeah. stimulating private sector innovation. Yeah, that's a great question about um, ecosystem and domestic ecosystem. So, part of the infrastructure bill funding actually requires think certain things to be built. It's called BABA, Build America, Buy America. It needs to be built and made in America. And so part of the funding, particularly, is, sent, is to stimulate innovation, because a lot of the products actually had to be sourced domestically. And currently, we don't have the capacity to build and make all the items that we need uh, in America right now. And so that's a big forcing function for innovation for people to start new companies, uh, to develop some of the key 
products that need, that need to be procured. So that's like a demand pool that's built into this infrastructure bill. And so there's a uh, Made in America office in the White House that's certainly uh, leading this effort. But it is a, for those who innovators here domestically, it is a really a way to think about the types of things that you could create and make and have procured by the government. So that's one aspect of it, you know. Um, but it's certainly we want to not cut ourselves off, ourselves off globally from innovations that are happening around the world. And so that's part of the, the balance that's being done is like we want domestic sourcing to build our capacity here, but also continue to work deeply with innovators and partners globally. Far behind, yeah. uh, towards the end of your talk. And we've all noted the extension or expansion from DARPA to ARPA-E, most recently ARPA-H and ARPA-I. As you're doing your ARPA-I, what things are you thinking of doing differently from mm -hmm. DARPA? And what things are you thinking of doing similarly? Oh, that's Basically, a great question. The good and the bad are you changing. That's a great question. There's a lot of great things we're, gonna, we're doing, taking for both of those organizations. DARPA and ARPA-E. There's really great things to learn. We've been close touch with them to, to learn those lessons. Um, particular characterization, character of ARPA-I in transportation and infrastructure is that getting to deployment is incredibly important. Nothing, I mean, that's certainly true for, for those other two, but for us, getting, uh, working with implementation partners is really important. We know most of our customers, for example, from federal, on the federal side are the states. We have state formula money that goes to states. We know municipalities. We almost have like a finite call list. It might be 10,000 entities that would build infrastructure, but we know who they are. And part of what we're learning and, and a unique thing about ARPA-I, we're gonna work our best with those entities on, to get to deployment and scale fast. So that's one lesson that we might do a little bit different. You know, DARPA has the defense agencies, they have customers built in, right? So they have that relationship. We kind of have something like that with our deployment as well. So we're going to do it different, but like, that's a unique thing we'll, for our buy. That's one aspect. Okay. Thank you.